everybody else feel free. And I'm going to share my screen so you all can see who I, what I look like. Um, can you see me and can you see the foils? Yep. All right. Okay. Cool. So we'll go ahead and jump in. My name is Richard McGrew. I've been uh, in, at Intel for 23 years. And uh, about five years ago, I was sitting on a couch trying to figure out when I could retire. And the numbers weren't very pretty. I had a nice, beautiful spreadsheet that showed me all the vectors of things that could change in the market. And, uh, you know, retirement was still quite a ways away. So I started looking at what I could do to accelerate that. And like most of you, I've been dumping the maximum into my 401k along with uh, Intel matches and everything else and the great stock market rise. Uh, but a stock market crash at the wrong day could destroy my retirement. So uh, I decided to get into real estate. And if you want to hear more about that path, I'd be happy to come back and talk about how I got into it. I've been doing it four years now. And about three years ago, I started investing in notes, maybe three and a half years ago. Um, I uh, currently only have a few notes. Um, I've actually pulled back from the market and waiting with cash for the market to do something different than what it's doing right now. Um, but, uh, you know, there's never there's never the right time to get in. Right. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, jump in on the materials. I guess one other comment, um, I did do go down the path of uh, taking on investors and managing other people's money in the note business. And while I didn't lose anybody money, um, I didn't make money myself. Um, it's a it's a strange business. You have to have a large portfolio in order to make money as a as a manager. And I didn't I didn't chase that. I got a day job and, and I, so I keep it on the sides to build my own wealth. If you're not speaking, you could please mute. That'd be great. We're getting a lot of background noise. Thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and jump in here. So um, I'm not going to read this note, but for recording purposes, it's there. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to talk to that. But, you know, the starting message here is, you know, uh, we all know the stock market crashed a few years back. Um, and a lot of money was pulled out of the stock market in that part in that process. Um, and where does all that cash go and what do investors do when they're afraid of the stock market? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is kind of a, an alternative method of investing um, or an alternative asset class. There are a lot of alternative asset classes. Um, I, personally, I have my the majority of my wealth from Intel working here stored in the 401k, you know, and stocks and bonds and all of that. Um, but like I said, three or four years ago, I started diverting some of that money um, and all of my new money into other asset classes so that I could have some protection or some difference from the stock market. So I just grabbed this picture off of Yahoo Finance this morning. Um, it's uh, showing that the S&P at over 4,000. Um, that's just uh, amazing to me. And you can see across the horizon here, the S&P has done a lot of different things, right? And I don't know, um, we're not in a room, so I can't see your faces, but I wonder how many of you think the stock market's going to keep going up. Um, it's just crazy, right? It, and of course, I pulled out of the market um, about uh, a year ago, a little more than a year ago. And so I have not received, I pulled out of the market in my investments, my, my third party in non-traditional assets about a year ago. Um, so I've missed some of that rise. Um, and I hope I hope it never does never go down. But I wonder, you know, what's going to come next in the stock market. And you know, personally, it looks kind of like this to me. It's what I think of when I think of the stock market. And that's fine if you're young. If you're 20 something or 30 something, you've got another 20, 30 years to work. You can afford to ride the market. Um, I'm getting a little bit older, and I'd love to retire soon. And if I'm fully in the stock market, I think I'm at big risk. You guys probably wouldn't be here if you felt any difference, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. So we're going to talk about notes and what the difference, what, what a note is and how it works and a couple of case studies. Um, feel free if you guys want to ask questions, feel free. I've given this presentation about 50 times to different meetups. So I wrote it like four years, three, three years ago, I guess it was now, and I've done it many, many times. So I think it's pretty bulletproof. That said, you never know. Um, and I don't have any COVID. I haven't updated it for COVID. So I've been trying to think through what I would add given the, the COVID changes and the impact on the market. Um, and if you guys have comments, feel free to jump in. All right. So the first question everybody asks is, what's a note? Well, a note is a, a an instrument that you provide that, that shows that you're willing to get payments for something that you give out. Right. And so a hundred dollar bill is a, a note. A check is a note. It's a promise of payment. Right. A, a car loan is a note. 
And of course, home loans are notes. Now, we're going to talk today, the rest of this session here, on mortgage notes. So there are lots of other types. You can get notes on just about anything and then make money or lose money on those assets. Let's talk about how a note works. So uh, let's talk about a home uh, with a loan of $100,000 just to make the numbers round and easy to talk about. At an interest rate of 10%, which today seems crazy, but not too long ago, interest rates were you know, up in the 8, 10, 12% range. That's a lot of the notes that I purchased today are in those higher interest rate spaces. Um, this particular note got a term of 360 months, at, which gives a payment of $878. And then this guy, John Hancock, signs it and says, yes, I'm going to pay back this note. Thank you for lending me the money. Pretty simple. You guys are probably all super... This is pretty trivial stuff. So let's talk about a transaction. So I've got a seller and he's got an asset for sale at 110,000 and there's a buyer. I've got a mortgage lender and the buyer is willing to give $10,000 to the seller. The bank is gonna trade a note for $100,000 to the buyer who's gonna give that to the seller. So the seller now has his $110,000. The ownership deed goes to the buyer and payments go to the bank from the buyer. Now here's where we come in. And before I move on to us, did that first set of steps make sense? Anybody who wants me to go back through that first set, that's just a typical home purchase transaction. All right, I'll keep going. So here we are down in the bottom right-hand corner, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, and we've got a pile of cash we want to invest. We can talk to the bank, purchase that mortgage note from the bank, giving them the money and they give us the note, and now the buyer sends their payments to us instead of to the bank. I'll pause. Anybody have any questions about what just happened there? Can you repeat that just one more time? Yeah, of course. It's not it's not obvious for those people that haven't done it before. We'll just start back at the top. I've got a buyer and a seller and an asset worth $110,000 and a mortgage lender. The down payment goes from the buyer to the seller. The bank and the buyer trade note for $100,000 and the buyer gives that $100,000 to the seller. The ownership deed now goes to the buyer and the buyer gives the money, the payments to the bank. Investor comes in with money. They then buy the mortgage note from the bank. Okay. Note that the seller and the buyer are not involved, right? The investor and the bank are working together here. The investor buys the mortgage note from the bank and now the buyer has to transfer their payments. Instead of sending their payment, payments to the bank, they send their payments to the investor. So, so that's, and, that's like uh, what happens kind of often is like you're making your payments to Bank of America for your mortgage or whatever, right? And then right. all of a sudden, like in a couple months, you get notice that says your mortgage is going to change, right? So. Right. That's so exactly what's happening. This is where you make your payments to now. Okay. Yep. That's exactly the scenario. And the only difference here is you and I don't have have uh, billions of dollars to invest. So the name of our mortgage company is probably something a little simpler than the than the B of A or Wells Fargo or others that we're used to seeing on on paper. But there's nothing illegal about eat you and I all forming LLCs uh, companies and and making these transactions to become investors and basically to become the bank. So a question Again, is that Go ahead. Sorry. Question is that uh, this investor, uh, like for example, my house, my I I was informed by Wells Fargo that my investor is Fannie Mae, but I don't make payment to Fannie Mae. All right. You make a payment to a servicer. So um, we'll talk about servicers in a little bit okay. here. Um, as the investor, I don't personally ever call the borrower and ask them for payments. I, I use a third party, a servicer, just like the bank uses a servicer. Um, some servicers will deal with us small investors and they will, for a small fee every month, take care of all the borrower transactions, including payment collection and uh, outreach and other miscellaneous tasks. We'll go through that in a little bit. Good okay. question, though. What, what so, happens if they... Uh, 
Go ahead, keep going. I got lots of questions. Keep going. Uh, how would you approach the bank to become an investor? Yeah, uh, good question. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about how to buy and sell in a little bit. So just we'll hold on to that one. If I don't answer that, we'll circle back around. What so what 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 happens? I'm sorry. What happens if the buyer defaults? Great question. He doesn't pay yeah, us. We will talk bank about that as well. Big. We're going to talk about that as well today. It's a great question. Other so, question? As an investor, uh, how do you make your money? Because most people have like a fixed rate. So yeah. how do you get to the, your? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about that one as well. Sorry, I'm not answering all the questions because I'll get totally I'll, I'll get way ahead of us. We will talk about the, the bottom line is you buy at a discount. Um, you'll buy at a significant reduction versus what the actual unpaid balance is, and then you collect the difference. And that's how you make your returns. And I'll, I'll walk that through in a few foils. Richard, are you also going to talk about the idea of actually trading notes yourself with, to manage the interest rate differences and so forth? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll talk okay. about that. Thank you. Yeah, I've got, I don't know, 20 foils or so, and it usually takes me about a half an hour to go through. Um, but I find that if I jump and jump around in the foil deck, then people get lost if they haven't, they don't have a lot of experience in the note business. So I will walk through, but I love the questions. And you're also going to talk about the downfalls and pitfalls, the things to watch out for as well, right? Repeat that again. You're going to talk talk about the, the pros and cons, right? And the Oh, yes. Big yes camp. There, okay. is, there is risk here. Yes, I'll talk about risk. Thank you. Any, any of you that have heard me talk on the, the these, these meetings in the past always hear me as a little bit risk averse. Um, so, yes, it's very important that you manage your risk. And there's money to be lost for sure. All right, I'll go ahead and keep going. If this transaction makes sense, right? We are the investor. We're working with the bank to buy the mortgage. Once we have the mortgage, the buyer gets a notification that they need to send the payments to us, and then we receive the payments. I have one more one question. Uh, sure. Just to make sure that you are, you are going to answer, uh, am I a, be able to find out uh, the borrower uh, profile? Like, for example, I want to buy notes for the borrower who is like us, like you know, yes. good good people. Um, yes. Yeah, so let's just spend just a moment on that. Um, sure. We will talk about, um, probably not today, we probably won't get into today how you value a note. Um, but a note is primary, is valued based on three metrics, right? The the terms of the note, right? The payments, the interest rate, the, the borrower, the asset, right? So the asset that's behind the note, the mortgage, how, how strong okay. is the asset itself, right? And then um, finally, the borrower is a really important piece, right? And so if the borrower has never made their payments, or is 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 delinquent on uh, on a regular basis on all their payments they'll have a low credit score that it definitely affects what you're willing to pay for the note and of course it raises your risk but then raises your return if they do pay so we'll talk we won't talk about how to value a note beyond that today i don't have those foils prepared for us today that's probably another half hour 45 minute conversation be happy to come back and do that one if anybody's interested in actually purchasing notes you'll definitely want to know how to do it um, and how to how to make a good purchase because as you all know in real estate you make money when you buy um, and it's all about how you how you get yourself set up if you buy wrong you're you're going to be really stretched to make money okay I'm going to go ahead and jump in first case study this is my this is the first note I purchased um, it was a uh, beautiful home in I live in California by the way I bought a, a beautiful uh, a, a note on a beautiful home in New Vienna Ohio I had never heard of New Vienna Ohio before I purchased this note it's a four bed two bath on almost 2,000 square feet the value of the home when I purchased it just a couple of years ago now um, the value of the home is was one hundred and twenty thousand dollars this note the borrower's been paying it's the nicest home in town it's a small town um, I, I don't know who's living there, but it's obviously somebody important. It's absolutely the most beautiful home on a couple of acres. It's gorgeous, nice, nice yeah. property. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what what I purchased. So um, the the asset was worth one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and at the time I purchased it, the owner had an equity of sixteen thousand four hundred dollars. The remaining. Um, sorry, not, again, for those of you that are on the bridge that are not on mute, please mute yourself unless you're speaking. Um, so uh, the mortgage note was taken out when the borrower purchased this property. Would somebody mind going through the attendee list and right clicking and muting anybody who's um, showing up as making noise? That'd be great. Thank you.
Okay, somebody muted the speaker. So can Richard, can you unmute yourself? Uh, Richard, you're muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Loud yes, and clear. Yes. Thank you. All right, beautiful. Thank you for, for uh, taking care of the mute buttons. I appreciate that. Uh, please don't mute Richard McGrew unless you don't want to hear me talk. Um, all right. So um, the loan, the mortgage on this property, right, sixteen thousand in equity minus the, from the one hundred twenty thousand gives you a, a mortgage loan amount of one hundred three thousand six hundred. The interest rate they took out was at seven point nine nine, which um, oops, my mouse is misbehaving, uh, which uh, gave over a term of three hundred and sixty months gave a monthly payment of seven hundred and fifty nine dollars and forty six cents. This is a first lien mortgage uh, secured by the property. 162 payments later, I come along, and at that point, the borrower has 36,593 in equity. Um, there's a mortgage note. The, the, the balance, uh, the unpaid balance on the mortgage now it is 83,407. I purchased that mortgage note. I purchased that $83,000 mortgage note for 69,175, and there were 190, 198 payments left when I made the purchase. So I'll pause here. I'm sure that caused a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. How did you get it for 69,000 right. when the note is worth 83,000? Exactly. So the question is, what is the note worth, right? Um, just because the borrower owes 83,407 doesn't mean it's worth that much. And so it really does come down to just like when you're purchasing anything else in the marketplace, what is the asset that you're purchasing worth? And if you are a note investor, right? You're not willing to pay. You need to make a return. And so a seller of a note can't sell the face value of the note to most people, right? There are some that will pay almost full value, 90, 95, 98%. Um, and those people are able to get the best notes. And somebody asked earlier about, I want to buy the note on someone like myself who makes every payment and has for the last 30 years. Um, those notes are all gobbled up by people that are willing to pay 98% of unpaid balance. This borrower has been in trouble in the past, um, is stable right now, but has been in trouble in the past. And so when you purchase the note, you're purchasing at a discount because of uh, problems with either the asset, the borrower, or the paper. Right? And so this is where becoming educated, and someone asked about risk earlier, becoming educated on what the value of a note is is super important. Um, because you are taking risk by buying any asset in the marketplace, and notes are no different. And Richard, you're also, the amortization is front-end loaded, right? So the bank is recouping most of the benefit towards the early payments, yes? That's right. That's why, that's why the banks are willing to sell the notes, because as they get further down, they're, they're less and less capitalized. They have more and more skin in the game. It's much better for them to have a, a payment that is 90% interest, because interest is, is earnings, right? Um, versus, you know, half of the money coming back in principal is not nearly as attractive for a bank. So and the reason, why, the reason why it's such dis discounted so much is because this is kind of like a risky, um, it's a risky investment, right? Because this particular mortgage had some issues. Because I was thinking, why don't I just buy out my own mortgage, right? Yeah. And I'm bank paying won't, The bank now, won't sell you. The bank won't sell you a specific mortgage, right? So, um, yeah, I would love to buy my own mortgage or buy buy your mortgage for that matter, right? But the, but uh, we'll talk through a little bit about how to purchase notes, not very much today. Um, but yes, this is a risky investment, just like buying a fix and flip is a risky investment or buying a rental is a risky investment. There are risk factors, and we'll talk a little bit today about these case studies and show you where some of the risks that I took were and what the profit opportunities are, right? And um, if we want no risk, then we probably should stay in the house with a mask on under the stairway with some safe food, right? And if we want to make money beyond what we're making in our day job, we have to take some level of risk that is different from the risk that we take every day coming to Intel or any other day job for that matter. So yeah, I'll walk through the risks and, and definitely, yes, there is risk associated with this asset. And that's why there's a, that's why there's a business opportunity for us. 
Okay, so let me keep going. I think this will make more sense. So here's um, this thing that I purchased, right? This this note for sixty nine thousand. Uh, payments of $759 are due to me every month for the next 198 months, and they start coming into my mailbox. So every couple of weeks, I go out to the mailbox and I find it stuffed with junk mail, but once a month, I get a check for $759. Um, and if I wait 198 months, I will have received $150,373. Anybody curious on how that became 150 when I only, only oh, was only owed 83407 the interest right exactly right now of course that's that 7.99 percent i think it was that's right yeah and of course now i only paid sixty nine thousand. so uh the next click that is an effective annual interest on my investment of 11.2 percent that's that's a um, time value of money right i'm still making 11 percent, 11.2 percent on my sixty nine thousand that i invested when I receive 150,000, oops, somebody's off mute again with a nice squeaky door. Um, so by investing 69,000 over uh, 198 months, 15 or so years, right? I get an 11% return across that time frame if everything goes well. And we'll talk about things going well and things not going well in a couple so, of weeks. Sorry, uh, if the interest rate was around 8%, uh, how, how it went like uh, 11%? Because I bought at a discount. I got the note, oh, okay. sixty-nine thousand, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And There's... Richard, are you going to cover like, say, say that you have repercussions, like they default on their loan or whatever? Yep. We're going to talk about. If you bought the note for, okay, you, okay. Yeah, yeah well, we've got three case studies in here. The first one is the simplest. Um, it sets the baseline, and then we'll go through some non-performing examples where borrowers stopped paying, and we had to go through foreclosure or other miscellaneous activities. Can the borrower right, so, can the borrower refinance? You know how yeah. we can they refinance and get a lower interest? Do they do it through you or a bank, or how does that work? That's a great question. So, um, best case scenario for me, I buy this note on January first, and on January second, the borrower decides to refinance. They're refinancing the eighty three thousand four hundred seven. So I will get a check for eighty three thousand four hundred seven when they refinance with some other bank. And I only paid 69,000. That's a much higher than 11% return in case of those of you that are doing the math, right? Um, if I can pay 69,000 and tomorrow get 83,000, you know, $14,000 in a day, that's a pretty good return. So uh, yes, the borrower can refinance. Um, it will walk through a couple of scenarios in a, in, in a few foils where, where uh, we as the bank can also offer refinance and we can offer all kinds of other creative workouts to help the borrowers. Richard, sixty-nine thousand dollars is your cash money. You are not borrowing right. this money, right? Is your cash? Well, money. I could, I could, I could borrow the money. I'm not in this scenario. Okay. Richard, are you planning on sharing the marketplace where you bought this note at? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Richard, out of that um, eleven point two percent, right? There's something that uh, is being paid to the servicer that's acting as a middleman for you to get the payments. That's right. That's right. And so that will reduce your return a small amount, right? $30 a month or $18 a month, depending on the services that you use. There's also a lot of other variables. What if they stop paying for a year? Well, you know, what if you have to pay their taxes while they're trying to recover from a divorce? I mean, there's a lot of miscellaneous things that come in here. Any one of those scenarios increases or decreases your return, depending on how it's managed and, and what you do with it. I see. Thank you. Yeah, with, uh, with so many refinances and the interest rate being so low these days, at least for like uh, more than a year, uh, do you still see there is a lot of opportunities in this area? Yeah, we'll talk about opportunity a little bit and how to purchase and get into the market. Yes, I believe there's still lots of opportunity. Um, like with any asset class, um, you either have, as an investor, you either have too much money and not enough assets to purchase, or you have not enough money and too many assets to purchase or some combination in between. But it's very rare when you personally have a lot of money to invest and lots of really cheap assets to purchase where you can make lots and lots of money. So the note market, uh, I can walk you through some thoughts on the current status of the note market and where I am currently sitting myself personally and whether I think it's a good time to invest. Um, but I, I'd rather get through the basics of note investing, and then um, I'm sure Daniel can bring me back to share my opinions on on different markets and different classes of assets. Uh, hey. I do believe. 
I do believe there's money to be made in the note market today. Hey, Richard, quick question. What, what are the tax implications for, for mortgage notes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not going to cover that elsewhere, so I'll go ahead and cover it here. Tax Notes are not tax deductible. Um, you, uh, if uh, That 69000 that I paid there, I didn't really understand the tax implications when I first jumped in. I used after-tax money for that, and any profit I make gets taxed at full tax value. Um, the smarter way to do it, and the way I do it now, is with my self-directed IRA, right? So we take our, you can take your IRA money, not your Intel, not your Fidelity, but other IRA money, you can take that, put it into a self-directed IRA custodian account, and from there you can invest that money in the stock market, but you can also invest it into notes and other things like that, and then that money is then protected from taxes until you withdraw it, just like your 401k is. But you have to be 59 and a half, right, for that? To withdraw the money, yes. Or tax self directed IRA or whatever you do right now? So, so for example, uh, my wife retired a couple of years ago. She put her entire 23 years of corporate 401k into a self-directed IRA. And now that money is investable by her. And by, choices that she makes can then be executed by the custodian. And the custodian will, make the, will take the actions that she defines. And uh, that money is then invested. And all profits go back into the IRA pre-tax and only get taxed when we choose to, to pull the money out of the IRA. So she is less than fifty nine and a half. I'm sorry, I don't. I, there, Daniel has had this topic on self-directed IRAs in here multiple times. Okay. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. I know there's probably plenty of recordings on self-directed IRA. Um, if you guys want, personally, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But fundamentally, note investing is a great place to do. Self-directed IRAs are a great place to do note investing. Doing it with direct cash means you're paying taxes. So that 11.2% return was lower than 11.2 when you pay tax on it, obviously. So Richard, did I hear you right? So even the principal payment is uh, taxed? No, no, just the, just the interest. Just the interest, okay. Yeah. I think somebody's speaking, but your mic's probably not close to your, your mouth. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you. Okay, so how come the uh, income that you report isn't as like a 1099 interest income? Yeah, I'm not going to get in. I'm not a CPA, and I'm not going to get into the the reporting structure. I do. I use. I I pay a CPA uh, every month uh, to manage my bookkeeping and my taxes, and to make sure everything is clean. You know, I have quite a bit of money inv invested in this space. I have over the past few years, and so uh, I've paid extra to have everything taken care of and make sure I do it properly. The tax situation regarding notes is non-trivial, and most of your real estate CPAs out there have no clue how to manage notes. So you need to find somebody who knows how to spell note um, when, you, when you get into the note business. Because CPAs don't, by, by definition, don't understand this space. It is more complex from a tax reporting perspective. All right, I'm going to keep going on the examples here so we can get through it. Um, so um, if I keep this note, so what are the exit strategies? You bought an asset, you have to know you can get out of it and make money, right? So in this case, there's three and there's probably more, but there's three primary exit strategies out of this performing class of notes. Obviously, if I keep this note until maturity and I get a payment every month and everything goes as planned, ignoring the servicing fees like somebody brought up earlier and tax implications like we talked about, that's an 11.25% return. It's not a bad return. Um, I'm pretty happy to get 11% on my portfolio, um, except right now when the stock market's just doing this goofy stuff, I feel like I'm losing money, but I know that's just a matter of time. Um, another option, I can accept an early payoff. Like we talked about earlier, somebody asked about refinance. If I buy the note at 69,000 and it's worth 83 and they pay off, guess what? I made a better than 11% return because the, the time value of money and also the, the time frame that you hold the asset makes a big difference on the return. The nice thing is that happens pretty frequently. The problem is you can't predict it. So um, I wouldn't have you go and create a, um, a probability model to figure out how frequently somebody's going to pay off so you can figure out what percentage of your assets are going to pay off. It doesn't work that way and probably does. Somebody smarter than me could probably figure it out. Uh, I, I would just say don't count on things paying off, but know that they will and you'll get a better return when they do. Um, and then finally, um, you can do what's calling, called selling a partial. And I love this strategy. I'll talk about it. I've got a full case study on it here shortly. Um, basically, um, it allows you to, well, I'll walk through it in a minute, but that's another exit strategy out of a performing loan. 
I guess I probably should include, you can sell the loan. You can say, maybe that's a good point. That's why I missed that one. You can choose to sell the performing loan and you're selling, you'll be selling it at a discount, just like you purchased it at a discount and based on the number of payments and the borrower's payment history and the condition of the asset that will affect what purchase price you get on the asset when you sell. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, we're gonna talk about partials next. So let's just go a little bit deeper here. So I've got this loan that I uh, purchased. I've got 198 payments of $759 due. The front end of the payment, I'm gonna sell, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm choosing as an investor, I'm gonna sell a portion of the payments to an investor, to another investor. Right, so in this scenario, I'm going to sell the first 132 payments. So that's about what 11 years, and I'm going to hold the remaining 62 payments, 66 payments, sorry, for myself. Now, what's interesting here, I am going to be very motivated to get these 66 payments as the seller. Right, I'm very motivated to receive. That's a lot of money, right? 66 times 759 bucks is not a small amount of money. Um, so I'm going to help this front end investor when I do this. So this front end investor, I'm going to charge them $69,275 for that purchase of these 132 notes, 132 payments, sorry. They're going to collect $100,248, which gives the investor a 7.3% return. Now, I know the stock market's crazy and everybody thinks they're going to keep getting these double digit returns. But before that happened, um, how many people here would like to see a 7% return on their investment of 70 grand? It's not a bad return. It's separate from the stock market. I'll pause there. Any questions on what that left side shows? All right, we'll keep going. So uh, now, sorry, go ahead. Uh, how did you decide this is, uh, you're going to, uh, so you're selling 132 payments, but how yeah. did the number 69275 come? Yeah, so what I did personally, I built a spreadsheet that allows me to figure out if I want to recoup, remember I paid 69,175 for this asset. And so what I want to do, um, my strategy is to sell a portion of the note such that I can get back my full investment so I no longer have any money in the deal, but I still have some asset remaining, which is the back end of the note. And so using uh, time value of money and interest rates and everything else, I have a simple calculator that tells me if I want 69,275, which gives me 100 bucks in profit, right? Um, I need to sell 132 payments at a seven point, if I want to give the investor a 7.3% return. I could have made that 8% or 9% or 2%. I could have made the number, the interest rate, anything I wanted. And I could have made the amount of money I wanted to receive any particular value. And then based on the spreadsheet math, the way that came out is selling 132 payments at 7.3% return for my investor, um, I need to recoup 69,275 to make that make that happen. Okay, thank you. So this yeah. is very good, right? You are basically, you know, you can sell it right away or maybe even a month. And then you are basically having this bonus, right? Which is 66 payments after some that's time. That's right. That's 11 years later, when, if everything goes well, that's an if, right? If the yeah, market if. goes well and everything goes well, then 11 years from now, an asset that I have no money involved in yeah. It's going to start paying me six seven hundred fifty nine dollars for sixty six months. So I'm going to hold that back end, that back end, and I'm going to make sure that this borrower over this investor over here is successful because if they aren't, I don't get my payments right. And so I need to make I need to keep an eye on this asset. I can't just ignore it. I need to keep an eye on it and make sure that it stays healthy so that my back end my front end investor gets paid. And at the end, when they're all done and they're out of the out of the picture, then I'll start getting paid. What to that if point, he refinances. Sorry, go ahead. What if he refinances before the your portion comes That's upon? a great question. My next couple of foils is going to click through that exact example. Great um, before before you jump there, then uh, on the refi, it, uh, if if the asset defaults uh, or becomes we'll late walk, payments we'll or whatever, we'll walk through that as, we'll we'll through that as well. well. Great, thanks. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I get this is brand new for all of you. Don't please don't take my weight comments as anything other than I just got a flow. I want to work through it. We will get to all of your, all those questions so far. But I have a question. So there is a possibility that the person that you are selling to could sell it to someone else also, right? No, um, I hold in the contract. I specifically state they cannot resell the the the, the, the asset, um, the note. Um, if they need to sell it and they need to get out of it, they need to negotiate that with me to sell it back. 
Okay. They're buying. They're buying a, a, a 132 payments for $69,000 at 7.3% return, and my contract very clearly states what they're allowed to do and not do, and primarily all they're allowed to do is accept the payments. Okay, thank you. And if I have structure? right. Sorry, go ahead. Is that structure that you're setting up? Is that exactly what you said? Just a contract with another investor? Yes, that's right. It's just a contract. Now they do get title to the property. They get title, not title to the property. They get um, recorded at the county with the uh, the actual uh, note and mortgage. Sorry, the actual mortgage gets put in their name, so that if I die or get hit by a bus, they have you know proof that they own something that they can then go and renegotiate and figure out a way out of. Um, but but of course, as long as I'm alive and still investing in everything, I have I have the contract states that I have the right to ma manage this asset. All right, let's keep going on the the forward path, and then we can work on all the little details, probably offline or separate meetings. So this, there's two blue lines on this thing. The first one is the 83407, starting at month zero, going out through 198 months. You can see this is the unpaid balance and how it'll pay off over time. Now, I didn't get to take partake in the awesome front end of this note, but that's a different discussion for another time. What I just sold for 69275 is 132 payments. And so you can see the delta between the light blue and the dark blue is what's left over for me. All right. And so if I go all the way, so at any given time, if it pays off, there'll be a delta left over for me and they, they'll, the investor will get their money. So let's just talk about this. So let's say that what happens if it pays off in five years? Somebody asked that question, that's a great question. So if it pays off in five years, the current unpaid balance will have gone down from 83,407 to 68,111. That's on this curve right here. And poof, the borrower, the, the amount that the um, owner of the, uh, the home will have to make sure it gets paid off is $68,111, okay? Now, the partial investor at that particular moment is due on this line, not this line. So they don't get the 68,000. They get on their curve, they get 42,574, mm -hmm. right? But they also already collected over that same time period, $45,568 in payments because those payments were coming in every month for the five years. So that means they've received, at the end of five years, they've received $88,142, which is a 7.3% return. That's what we promised them. That's what they're going to get. Does that make sense so far? I'm going to go through what we get as the fund end investor or the biggest the back end investor in this scenario. So your agreement is written specifically that says that they'll they'll get the interest rate for the period that the asset is is still being um, paid, not that they're going to get 100,000 and whatever it was in your example. That's right. That's right. Yeah, they're getting a 7.3% return on the 69,000 that they invested with the, the security being a piece of real estate located at 123 Main Street with a mortgage note that with a mortgage and a note that, that's defined this and that and everything's recorded at the county. So it's a fully uh, legal transaction with uh, the county um, that it's recorded in. Um, it's backed by a contract. Yes. Is it considered, Richard, a second secondary lien? No, this is still the first first mortgage on the property. Thanks. They're just they're just getting the payments for a period of time per a contract that that the bank and they agreed to. Do you review this contract with an attorney, or you you, you do it by oh, yourself? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, you won't. You don't write your own contracts. It looks looks like you fix the seven point three percent, but what about the risk sharing part? What about the what? The risk uh, sharing part between you and uh, the other investor. Yeah, so um, let's touch on risk in a bit. I think, um, yes, if the mortgage defaults, if something goes wrong, there's risk all over the place. And like I said earlier, so uh, if, if this say that instead of payoff, let's say this was a default at five years, well, the borrower still do 42,000 and that borrower in order to get their 7.3% return wants that 42,000. But if I ignore this thing and let them go manage it, they're going to pay $7,000 to a lawyer. They're going to pay $5,000 to some crook to do something else and $2,000 to somebody else. And pretty soon this dark blue piece right here is all gone and they will mess it up because they have no experience in managing the back end of a note and the problems. And I will lose all of my interest in this loan. So I am very motivated as a seller of a partial to make sure that they are taken care of and that they don't have to deal with this because they don't have the experience and they will mess it up. 
they'll pay way too much. And as I did when I bought my first few notes, I paid way too much for basic services. Uh, I paid 1100 bucks to a lawyer to write a contract. I can get that done for $30 today. So because I know who to go to, who has the standard contracts, who does it every day, day in and day out, who does it for tens of thousands of transactions a year, they give me the contract for 30 bucks. But when I first started, I paid way too much. And that's what this, that's what will happen here. And that's why it's so important that I'm involved to make sure that things go well. Um. I have a question here. So if if this loan is paid off in five years, what is your gain? Ah, okay, we're gonna go there next. Great question. Oops, oh, that button's not here. Hmm. I thought it was. Hmm. Interesting. I thought I had, I know I have the calculations that show the amount that I get here. The uh, it's not in the in the deck though, unfortunately. Basically, um I am zero into the into the note. And I'm going to get a payment for twenty six thousand, twenty five thousand and change, um, with no money in the deal. Anybody tell me what that interest rate is? Pretty it's high. Infinite. Infinite. Yeah. yeah, it's it's infinite, right? It's ridiculously high. It's not infinite, but it's ridiculously high because I actually have negative one hundred dollars in the deal. Now I had to pay for lawyers and contracts and other miscellaneous stuff, so it's not really fair. If I only do one of them, it's not it's not a great return. Um, but if I can do 20 or 30 of these and have them sitting in my 401k, just, just clicking away and waiting for the, waiting for my day to, re to retire, I'm pretty happy, right? This is a pretty awesome scenario where I'm going to get payments for having no money in and my 401k is just going to receive those payments. That's pretty awesome. So Richard, uh, so you have, you have nothing to lose, right? If you get the 69,000 upfront, I mean, even in default situation or whatever, you have nothing to lose, right? I mean, yeah. maybe you will not gain, but nothing to lose. Yeah. Um, yes, sort of. Um, uh, like any transaction, like, yeah, until the transaction is complete, you put $69,000 up to buy the asset. And until you actually do sell the parcel, you're sitting on $69,000 invested with no promise of return other than the 11% or the asset behind it. Um, there's also the possibility that you're a uh, partial buyer is unhappy and they want they want out. And if you don't help them and get them out, then they're going to badmouth you to you and to all of their friends. And that could damage your reputation. Um, you know, I'm sure we could come up with lots of potential risk. And, uh, and but, but financially, legally, financially, I have zero risk on this transaction. If you can say, yeah. Yeah, right. As Richard, long as I can. Yes, go ahead. Um, So this is a theoretical scenario. Was this a theoretical scenario or an abs a real scenario? I can't remember. This particular asset, I did not sell a partial on, but I have done this on other assets. So mm -hmm. the numbers are, uh, is this a realistic set of numbers or is it a actually very, more? Very, very realistic. Okay. Yeah, the one, the one that I did, I actually sold at 8.2% return. I was too nice and gave too high of a return. Um, I would, I, if we can walk through the scenario, I didn't put that in the deck. Um, but yes, I've done, I've done a couple of these. Um, I have friends that are um, uh, begging me to introduce them to this forum so they can sell you guys notes. Um, uh, I won't do that, obviously. Uh, if anybody wants contacts on how to buy notes, I'd be happy to hook up with my buddies. They, um, they do this day in and day out. I've got a buddy who's 65. He's got like 80 of these things. I've got other friends that have got even more. Um, hundreds of these transactions that they've done over the past 20 years, and they're just sitting on millions of dollars in zero in. They've got zero investment in and tons of money uh, ready to come to them. It's basically wealth, right? Now, things can go wrong and houses can burn down and insurance can be, not be paid. And so the real numbers aren't the exact numbers that they think they have in their account, but it's a whole lot better than uh, just cash in a bank or just uh, your 401k riding the stock market. I, so I wanna, what I was I getting pause, at was hold on a second. Uh, I want to pause here just for a second. Um, if we're going to do Barrett time, we have four minutes. Um, <laughs> I am. I don't have anything on my calendar because this thing was booked for two hours. I'm willing to go as long as you guys want to go. We've only gotten through about half the foils because of all the awesome conversations uh, and questions. And uh, I've promised a lot of answers that I've not yet given because I told you I would cover them. So I'm going to propose that I, I'll keep going as long as there's say ten or more people left on the bridge. Um, you guys are welcome to drop off if you're not interested. And is that everybody okay with that? I'll keep the recording going. You can go back and watch it later. Sure. Yeah. We actually have 13 minutes left. Well, spare time would put us at three minutes, right? That's a good plan. All right. Okay. I'm going to keep going. There was somebody who was asking a question and I cut them off. 
Oh, I was just asking the principal amount, the actual investment amount of of uh, sixty nine or forty two uh, sixty eight thousand. I don't of the sixty eight thousand dollars. Is that generally what you would be expecting to have coming into it, or is it it realistically in today's market more than that, like hundreds of thousands of, of dollars? Ah, okay. So you're asking, can I really purchase a note for sixty nine grand? Yes. yes. The so, so if you're in California and you want to buy my note, no, you can't buy my note for 69000 because the house is worth some stupid amount of money. If you live in New Vienna, Ohio, which is where this particular asset is, um, then that part of the countryside, I don't, probably some of you are from that area, the mar market prices don't go up and down very much. That house, you know, four years later, is probably worth about $120,000. And that mortgage note is still worth, you know, wherever it's at today, $60,000, $70,000. And the, uh, I have lots of notes in the, I primarily purchase my notes in the Midwest uh, because that's where I can afford to buy notes. I can't afford to buy notes in California and the banks don't sell to people like me with my kind of money uh, notes in California very much unless I want to buy in a really bad area. Uh, so primarily, if you're going to get into note investing, just like if you want to get into rentals, you're not going to buy in California or in Portland, Oregon, because you just can't afford the assets or uh, the numbers don't make sense. The, the, the ROI is not there. So I buy Indiana, Illinois, uh, Chicago, Ohio, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, um, all over that whole space over there. Um, I've never been, I've only been there once. Um, so, and I've never seen my, one time I went through, I drove by all the assets, but I'm the bank. I'm not allowed to knock on the door or say hi, or um, I just, I just own the mortgage. Of the note. All right, I'm going to keep you. going. Yeah. All right, so the second case study is a non-performing note. This is going to answer a bunch of questions around what if, what if something goes wrong. So this particular asset is in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Uh, this was an asset, uh, three bedroom, one bath, 1,800 square foot. Seriously needs a paint job if you look at it and probably some serious roof work. Um, this is not the pretty asset that I showed you on case study number one, and this is much more like what I wind up purchasing. Um, and there's risks here, right? There's a lot less risk, less risk on that first asset in the asset itself, um, because if the borrower stops paying, I actually wouldn't mind living in that first house I showed you. I don't think I'd live in this house here. Um, I, maybe, maybe I would. I'd never been there, but um, uh, it definitely looks pretty dodgy to me. That said, the current market value is only $37,000. So somebody asked if you could find a note for 69,000. Guaranteed, if you wanna pay 69 grand for this, the note on this property, they will sell it to you. <laughs> um, but you won't have to pay $37,000 because it's a non-performing note. Yeah, you won't have to pay 69,000 because it's a non-performing note and we also pay at a discount. So we would pay on whatever the mortgage is. So let's look at what that was. So this note, when it was first originated, the home was worth $90,000. Um, the original mortgage, the original note uh, was 81,167 at an interest rate of 3.8% over 504 months, which gave a payment of $322.58. And 2008 came along and the home was only worth $37,000. Uh, the borrower stopped paying and they were upside down, right? Their unpaid balance at that point was 75870 Every eight hundred seventeen dollars. That is um, just barely below what they paid, what they started at, right? Interest rate still three point eight months. They have four hundred and eighty months remaining. Their payment is still three hundred and twenty-two dollars and fifty-eight cents. Makes sense so far. All right, we'll keep going. Yes. So we purchased this note for eighteen thousand and ten dollars. So. On the prior note, we paid $69,000 for an $80,000 note. That's something in the 80% range, 82%, 83%, I think was the percent of unpaid balance. In this, and that was a very nice asset, pretty good borrower, um, you know, good note, good paper on the note. Um, in this case, this is a pretty damaged scenario, right? This house isn't in that great a situation. If I have to take this thing back, I don't want to go live there for sure. I got to pay for repairs and get it to where I can be resold. I'm not willing to put up 80% of value on a $37,000 property. Um, and so the offer we made and was accepted was $18,000 on this property, on the note. Again, we're not buying the property. I need to 
stop saying that, we're buying the, 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 the paper. Okay, so let's talk about what happens here. So um, this borrower hasn't paid since 2008, right? Um, they have 480 payments remaining. So uh, through the servicer, not directly, but through the servicer, uh, we found out that um, they did pay for seven years. The market crash spooked him and he stopped making payments, but he really doesn't want to move. Um, he was just frustrated by the drop in home value and, you know, taking advantage of the situation maybe, but he didn't say that, of course. Um, so what did we do about this? So um, we offered a loan modification. So we took the unpaid balance down from $75,000 where it was to about 80% of the home value, so to $30,000. And we changed the term from 504, or sorry, 480 months remaining down to 360 months at 9%. So you say, wait a second, you jacked the rate up on them. That's not fair. Yeah, but I took their unpaid balance from 75 grand to 30 grand and their term from 408 months down to 360 months. So I think I did them a favor, honestly. So their new loan is $30,000 loan at 9% for 30 years at $238 a month. What do you think that borrower felt about me as a bank coming in and offering this? Uh, they you. should be really happy. Right? Yeah, yeah, pretty happy. Right? Yeah, very happy. So I'm not the bearer of bad news. I'm not some foreclosure agent as a note investor, right? I have serious flexibility. How much did I pay for this asset? Do you guys remember? 37? 18,000. And I took that note and rewrote it as a $30,000 note at 9%, getting a payment of $238 on an investment of $18,000. Oh man, that's pretty good. And it's great for the borrower. So it's good yes. for me. It's good for the borrower. So um, and, now and I then, get... Go ahead. And then who partially. takes the loss? Who, who takes the loss? Who takes the loss? The bank that sold me the note took the loss. Yep. Uh-huh. Because they sold it, uh, it was worth 70 or something like 70, that, and you bought it for 18000 That's right. Exactly. And why would bank do that? <laughs> because it's... it's <laughs> I'll let you answer. You're the expert. No, yeah, you I, got I, the right answer, I'm sure. I would assume that they just want to get rid of it because they don't want to have to manage it in any way, and they don't want to take the risk of... It's already a loss. Those They're not going to get anything from it anywhere. It, that's right, and they don't have the time to manage a, an eighteen or a seventy thousand dollar asset, right? The, I mean, they so, and then on top of that, banks are penalized. Um, so you probably all—I'm not going to have time to go through all this—but banks can loan money out based on how much deposits we all put into their bank. They can loan nine, up to nine times whatever we give them. They can loan out as as loans. Mm -hmm. That's not right because they don't actually have gold or cash or anything to match all the money they loan us. They hope that we never come and ask for it. And in, so what happens here, when they get a non-performing note on their books, the gov federal government says, okay, fine, but you have to carry that much in, in back assets. And so for every non-performing note, they have to hold more cash. Whereas before this you know, $75,000 that they have on the books as an asset that's due to them, before they could have gone and reloaned that money. Now they actually, because it's non-performing, they actually have to hold it, have to hold the cash and not loan it. And so mm. it's a huge penalty to banks to hold non-performing loans. So they're very motivated to dump them. Now, what we saw in the 2010 timeframe was a ton of foreclosures by banks. They got a ton of bad press. So instead of finishing out the foreclosure, well, we heard from whoever the president was at the time, how, how great a job they had done at fixing the foreclosure problem. What really happened is the banks got tired of the bad press and started selling off those notes to people like me. So I can still foreclose. <laughs> I can still foreclose, but I don't need to, right? I don't need to because if they'll start paying me on this new set of terms, I'm a super happy guy. I'm getting 238 bucks a month with only 18,000 in. Any of you know that 1% rule in real estate, that's not a bad investment. Now it's a really small investment. I got to do a bunch of these, but my, then my risk is mitigated and we can go on and on and on. But I'll kind of, I'll just keep going on this one here. The borrower is super grateful when they start paying, right? Now so you don't your... know how, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, quick question. So on this one, when you get the rate increased like this, um, I'm sure it makes it more attractive to be able to do a partial uh, mm -hmm. as well. We're right? going to talk about it... that next. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, oops, I guess not quite next. But okay, so I paid 18000 I also had another 1500 bucks in costs and closure and other miscellaneous stuff. Uh, we reinstated their, um, sorry, um, I didn't walk through this. 
Um, uh, well, so um, let me go back through this one. Sorry. So the reinstatement, where is the reinstatement? I didn't talk about it that at 30, all. It was 30,000, right? Yeah, I got the loan at 30,000. Like 80% of the 30,000? Yeah, something like that. So I sold the note for 24, but where is the 27,000 in reinstatement? Um, it's been a few months since I presented this and I'm actually forgetting what that one was. It's my bad. They didn't make a payment to do the refinance. How did I get the $27,000? You said he brought the note current. Was that from that? No. So they- no, Down at the bottom there, it says borrow brought the note current. They started paying, right? So they owe me. 30, so they owe me the unpaid balance of 30. You say 80% of 30,000. Right, right here on this screen, though. Of yeah. Modify the note. I'm the note. Yeah, but the 27,000 doesn't, somebody needs to go on mute that's speaking. Um, the 27,000 doesn't make any sense. So you didn't cover that either, though, the, bringing the loan current. Do they have to pay anything else besides? Well, I bought it current by basically wiping out a back debt of $45,000. Okay, but you didn't get any cash out of that. Okay. Correct. I did not take any cash. Again, so every scenario is different. I think my numbers on the next page are wrong. Every scenario is different and every borrower is different. Some are willing to talk to you, some are not. In this particular case, this borrower was willing to, willing, was, it had the emotional equity like I talked about before. He wanted to be, get, get back to being current. And so this was a very good thing for him. Um, so the you next, did, were you able to take a tax write-off for that Delta that you no, rewrote? No. It? no. no. It's paper. Um, there's no. It's, it's very different than real estate, and then there's no tax write-off for notes. And you did not ask him, Richard, as part of the restructure, to give you like say 10% upfront or something like that in the new in the, in the new format. A lot of times I do. So I'll try to get three or four thousand dollars upfront because there are fees. I do have to pay money. Um, and you know, if they're upside down, you know, 30, 40 grand, they're very happy to give three or four thousand dollars to get out of debt. Um, typically I don't do this work myself. I don't do the modification myself. So I pay a, I pay two servicers, one to manage the payments and keep me legal with the CFPB and all those different miscellaneous legal bodies. And then the second servicer is more of the, uh, when things get into trouble, I pay a second servicer to manage the borrower and figure out the best terms. I typically draft up the terms that I'm willing to accept. And then they, th this second servicer will go and figure out the best they can get out of the borrower. Um, I personally don't call borrowers because you can get into legal trouble and you can be accused of you know, anything they want to accuse you of. And the legal law system generally takes the favor of the borrower, not the lender. So I just, as a rule, don't contact the, the borrowers. Um, I just don't think it's, I, may, I, I have too much to lose to get into trouble legally. I'm just so wondering if that was maybe one of the things you did in order to be able to get to the 27 is asking for, for cash and as part of the refi. Yeah, I didn't do that. I, I something's wrong with my numbers here. I don't know. I, I didn't cover the reinstatement in the conversation, and it doesn't belong in the numbers. So what I see is profit on here is twenty four thousand minus the twenty minus the nineteen thousand. So that's about five thousand over a, a period of time. Um, if that's what happened, and I can't make out for me. Mm -hmm. What is but, a reinstatement? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, I'm, I didn't cover reinstatement, and I'll cover that later. Um, uh, at least, I, at least I, I do have materials on reinstatement. Um, but basically, it's getting the borrower to to, um, to come current and uh, redefine the loan. I'm going to walk through one more scenario. Um, this is another non-performing. This is a home in Beach Street, Ohio, four bedroom, one bath, 1,330 square feet. From the pictures, it doesn't look too awfully bad and damaged. Um, the, uh, let's talk through the scenario. So this was a 38 the house is worth 38,000. The note was for sale for 6,000. Um, we put in a very small amount, amount of money just to get the place to be able to sell, um, paid off the back taxes and we had some closing costs. So we're into this asset about uh, 11,500. Um, we, uh, that, that's a, that's a 30% investment to value, right? If you believe the home is worth 38,000. Um, and, um, uh, the home actually sold for thirty-eight thousand, um, and uh, that's not a bad return. I think I forget the numbers are in here. Uh, yeah, okay. So that was actually a seven-month. It was pretty quick. 
Um, we did a, uh, we actually didn't sell the home. We did a deed in lieu, um, uh, which is basically getting the borrower to agree they can't pay anymore, that they aren't able to pay anymore, but they want out of the mortgage. They're upside down and they don't want to stay. Um, you can typically, as part of the cost that I had on the prior foil, you can give them a couple of grand. They'll use that to move and then they will sign over the, the, the deed and the property to you. And now you own the property and then you can sell the property. So in this scenario, what basically happened, I went to them, I had the servicer go to them, um, couldn't negotiate a, a, a repayment plan. They just were too far upside down and too many problems. Um, so instead of trying to foreclose on them and put them through all that pain, we just said, hey, what if we give you a couple grand and you guys walk? Um, all you have to do is take your garbage out of the house and sweep the floors. You don't have to make it beautiful or anything. We'll take care of that. Um, you'll sign over the deed to us. We, our lawyer will give you a check for a couple of grand. You walk away and uh, then we own the home. And they were happy to do that in this scenario. Uh, and uh, this was a decent return for us. Now, I didn't walk through. This is the last uh, case study I have. I don't think I have a case study. I don't where I lost money. I did. I did lose money on several of these. Um, uh, it's a very similar scenario, but when I got inside the home, um, which you, by the way, when you buy a note, you can't go inside the home, right? So, uh, when I went inside the home, it had been completely stripped and destroyed. The kitchen was gone. The floors were gone. The bathtub was gone. The fireplace didn't continue down below the roof line. Um, the sewage was destroyed. I mean, everything about the home was destroyed. I lost about 24,000 on an investment of 25,000. So there are real risks. Um, um, I have things that I would do differently on that particular purchase where I lost that money. Um, if anybody on this call has done fix and flip or has done a rental, uh, if they're being honest, they will tell you about the losses they had also. Uh, Daniel talks about investing in apartments. There are big losses to be made in investing in apartments, but big wins to make as well. So in all these scenarios, as an investor, my advice, if you're going to buy notes or rentals or apartment complexes, is don't buy just one because you're playing the odds. You're, you're playing the odds that things are gonna go well and most of the time they do, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, it's ugly. And so if I had been, if this was my only purchase here, I'd be very happy I made 27% return, but I'm not showing the case studies on the assets where I lost you know, 87% or where I lost my entire investment or, you know, and most investors don't talk about those. Most salespeople don't talk about those. They are real, losses are everywhere. And, you and I all went to college to get education. We paid a small fortune to get that education so we can get a great job in real estate. Those, co those colleges more or less don't exist until you, you pay for your education by making mistakes and mistakes cost money. And so I've lost a lot of money. I've also made a lot of money and net net, I think my return, I'm someplace around 11 or 12% across my whole portfolio. It's not as sexy as some of these foils would make it sound there's real money to be lost. So if you guys want to invest in notes, I'd be happy to help you start looking into it. Um, uh, you definitely want to get a mentor, get somebody that's got some training, uh, get the training before you start dumping, you know, even 10, $20,000 in, because there are real ways to lose money. So the question, question is, can I go? I have I have a question on the slide that you're presenting. Yeah. Uh, so when you uh, got, this note, don't you have a chance to go and look at the house so that would eliminate the losses like the sewage and the and all the yeah. things that you mentioned earlier? It's a great, it's a great question. When you buy a house, when you buy a buy a rental, when you buy a fix and flip, uh, you get to go and look inside the home. And you buy uh, it's kind of like this buying notes. You don't just like when you buy a tax deed, right? When you buy a tax deed, you don't get to go in the home because you don't have any right to go in. Right before you own the mortgage note, you don't have any right to go in the home. And even the, how often has your bank said they do have a clause in most most mortgages that they're allowed to come in and inspect the home? But how often have they done it? I've been in homes for 30 plus years, and never once has the bank said, "Hey, I'd like to come and inspect your home." It just doesn't happen. So um, uh, no, you generally you buy sight unseen, and you do things like you you send a broker to drive by the house and and look at it from the outside, and yeah, it looks pretty nice. Um, but that's about the extent of what you get. There are people that will go and knock on the door. If you give them 30, 40, 50 bucks, they'll go and knock on the door and talk to the borrower. Sometimes they'll get invited in for cookie and cake, um, coffee, right? Um, you can get creative, 
um, that's just extra time investment and everything else. And um, uh, again, like I said, you're kind of playing the numbers there. Would it be legal to send someone who could go and talk like that? Um, I don't know about legal. Um, like, would it bank, not cause problems for you in whatsoever as, way? As an investor, you have no legal right to go inside the home. If you decide to pay somebody to go knock on the door and say hello to the borrower, you know, make friends with them and then go in and have some have some coffee, uh, no problem if you can make that happen. There's nothing illegal about you paying somebody to go and say hi to a person that lives at a particular asset or address. Um, that's just extra work for you and, and may may mitigate some risk. And, you know, all of us have day jobs. And if this was my entire 401k on a single asset, you bet I would try to do everything I could to learn about it. When I'm investing, you know, $11,500 halfway around the country, uh, I'm a little bit less protective over that investment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I had a question uh, that so knowing that you are doing notes right um, now in this note business, you don't have the equity equity kind of thing. So why don't you know you definitely thought about rental business and why did mm -hmm. you choose notes over rental like you know buying property and renting it out versus yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah, so um, rentals are uh, uh, do you have any rentals yourself? Yes. That's what yeah. I do actually. Yeah. The and and is it a passive investment? Um, passive? No, actually, I'm quite active. Uh, you yeah. know, I manage things. Uh, but right. but yeah, it's side. It's still inside. I hired employee. You know, right. to take care of it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the difficulties with rentals, and I'm sure there's people on here. I've only got a few, so I can't talk to the complexities of rentals. But one of the difficulties is dealing with tenants, toilets, and termites, right? And then of course. The fact that when things go wrong, you have to manage it and deal with it. In the mortgage space, in the note space, generally you're just the bank. You're paying a servicer to keep track of things, and things just go as they're supposed to go. The 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 difficult scenarios are when borrowers stop paying, just like when a renter stops paying. Right? Most most uh, renter rental owners don't talk about what happens when the when the renter stop paying, it can be very penalizing to as the owner of a rental to own a uh, rental that, that the borrower is just or the renter is just sitting in there and refusing to pay, uh, especially in California. Um, I imagine Oregon is the same way. Uh, so the laws tend to favor in those states tend to favor the renter. They can stay there almost as long as they want if they know how to play the game. And so same thing can happen in notes. Um, but you actually in that scenario and in, in the case of mortgage notes, you have a lot of a lot of legal stuff behind you. And um, we can walk through all the details. They are both good investments. The benefits of you know, pros and cons, we could probably put together a table pretty quick on pros and cons on uh, fix and flip and rentals and mortgage notes. And I would say this is just a different asset class. It's not better than those other asset classes. It's different than. And so I personally have, I don't know, right now, four or five rentals. I have a couple of Airbnbs. I have, uh, I don't know, four or five notes left. I have my 401k. Um, and so any one of those could go bad at any given time. And my hope, right, what I'm trying to build is wealth such that if one goes down, I can extract money out of another one that's on the high side and not have to pull money out of the stock market when I'm sitting at home retired uh, right at the time when the market has just crashed. So, so I, out I don't of know the if three, I answered your question. Yeah, Airbnb, rental, out of the three, you're enjoying notes more than other two uh, that you have invested? In, mm -hmm. in terms of your, you know, um, ease and, you know, your uh, your happiness, where are you more happy right now? Uh, um, March of last year, so that's a tough question. March of last year, uh, my my first Airbnb is Nashville, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, right just outside of Nashville. A seven minute car drive, I paid 600 grand for it and it was giving me about $9,000 a month in, in rental income. Um, I was sitting on April through September it booked at nine grand on the Airbnb platform and then COVID hit. Uh, my income went to zero for most of that same time period and my mortgage was still $4,000 a month. So sitting in March, February, I was thinking Airbnb was the best thing ever. I was going to make four, a little more than $4,000 a month in profit on an investment of 600 grand. And those are astronomical numbers. And I was getting prepared to buy more Airbnbs. And then COVID hit. And I can tell you right now, I sold that asset February of this year, um, deciding I don't know how long COVID is going to last. So 
Which asset class is better, I think is hugely subjective and it depends on the mark, what's going on in the marketplace. Right now, my best asset class is my 401k. It's going through the freaking roof, right? But I don't believe that's going to keep happening. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I would say get educated, pick one that you like. Uh, whenever anybody asks me on what they should invest in in real estate, I tell them to come to things like this. Come to, come to meetups and listen and see what tickles your fancy and dip your toe in. Get a mentor and try, get somebody you trust to guide you through it because you can throw money away really fast in any asset class. So have you started, you know, helping people on payment or you, you know, help people just how, how can I get help from you? Uh, if I need a yeah. Um I'd be happy to have a one-on-one. -on -one. If you feel free to put time on my calendar, we can walk through your options um, or we can have another meeting like this and we can do a whole group of people and we can talk about the, the options on getting in on note investing. There's, um, there's lots of options opportunity. I did have um, at the peak of my note investing, I had 34 assets and I had four LLCs with some folks from Intel and folks from outside of Intel. Um, uh, I had, I don't know, a million and a half dollars in assets in notes. Um, I started feeling about a year and a half ago that that was too, too much risk because of the potential for, uh, we haven't talked about it, the potential for inflation. If you own paper and inflation goes through the roof, what do you think that paper's worth? Mm -hmm. Still worth the same amount you paid for it, but but it still still returns the same amount that you paid for it, but its value is much much lower. And so I've been backing out of my my share of notes uh, because of the potential for inflation. Some people tell me I'm being too conservative. I don't know the right answer. Um, but note investing is a passive, more or less passive investment class until you get to these scenarios where you have to deal with. Uh, foreclosure and mm -hmm. rehab and things like that. Richard, Richard on this can... slide, on this slide, real real fast, twenty seven percent yeah. annualized return. When you sold it, you actually you had to pay taxes on that too, right? So is that twenty seven percent including the taxes that you paid on the profit? I'd, I'd have to go look at it. Um, my tax rate super low right now because I've lost so much money. Uh, on paper, right? Any of us that are doing, actually doing real estate investing, our tax rates are really low. Um, any of you who are not doing real estate investing, you you need to know that, um, you know, I think my average tax rate for the past few years has been around 11% um, because I lose so much money. But the funny thing is you buy an asset and you rehab it, they call that loss. You get to write all that off. And so your taxable income drops dramatically. You didn't lose money, um, but because you still got this huge asset that you just invested in, but your CPA and the government says you lost money. So uh, it brings your ta effective tax rates down. And I don't honestly know the answer. I haven't run this, this number here. My guess is it's pre-tax, that it's not a post-tax number because I, um, I, didn't, uh, I, I probably didn't put in the tax penalties. If you do this with an IRA, IRA, then this is a 27% annualized investment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Richard, can you comment a bit on on um, so uh, you've got uh, SDIRAs, you've got um, LLC formation, and so forth. Uh, talk about how the actual payment uh, flows work um, in in with your servicer and with your custodian to make sure that the checks that are hitting your mailbox in between your junk mail are are, are making their way in, and you're not worrying about taxation issues and so forth. Yeah, that's a good question. So. Um, Fundamentally, uh, I purchase everything in an LLC. Um, I don't purchase my own name most of the time, except my own personal home. Um, that's just a pass-through account. It's just, it's just money comes into that and then comes back through to me on my ta on my on my uh, on K1 statements and on my uh, taxes. Um, the servicer collects the payment from the borrower. The servicer then takes their fees and whatever we negotiated as the fees, they take their fees and they send me a check or an ACH for the amount of, amount of difference. If that entity that they're paying to is my LLC, then that check or that ACH comes to me or come, goes to the bank account for that particular business. Um, if that entity that purchased it is an IRA, then my IRA custodian receives that check. Um, my bank and my IRA custodian all have online statements. And so I can check whenever I want to verify that the payments came in. Um, I can also go to the servicer uh, portal. The servicers all have portals. I can go to their portal and find out what uh, payment was actually received and what fees were removed. And so I can do a quick spreadsheet to verify that what came in minus fees and what actually got to the 
my bank or my uh, custodian or my mailbox matched. Does that answer the question? That's great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so let me just finish out non-performing notes. So what are the exit strategies on a non-performing loan? Well, I can modify the loan, right? Um, uh, if I can modify the loan, meaning if I can get the borrower, we didn't, I don't think we talked, we always talk about modify. If I can get the borrower to uh, agree to new terms and modify that loan, well then obviously I've got a performing loan. I can keep it to maturity. I can accept an early payoff. I can sell a partial um, or I could sell as a performing loan. Right? Those are kind of my exit strategies if I can get the borrower to modify. If I can't, what if I can get them to accept a small check for in exchange for the actual deed? And that's one of the scenarios we talked about. In that scenario, I can accept the deed in lieu and now I own the asset. Um, and of course, from there, once I own the asset, I can sell the asset, I can rent the asset, I can um, uh, do a uh, for sale by owner and, and hold a note on that asset. I probably should put those sub bullets there. Um, and then if if all go, all else fails, I can I can hold a foreclosure. And I've had to do this a few times. Um, once you foreclose on the property, um, you now own the asset. You can sell it at the county auction. You can uh, you don't have to actually take possession during a foreclosure. You can agree that somebody else at the auction takes possession, and you get paid out of that out of that delta. Um, you can own it as a rental. And then um, the last one I have on here is kind of just a spoof on rentals, right? Um, there's this term in the real estate or in the rental market called turnkey, where you know, dummies from California and, and the Pacific Coast will pay extra if they can get a clean rental, right? And that already has a renter and it already has a property manager. They call that turnkey. And basically, it takes all the work out of it and allows someone like me to come in and buy a cleaned up rental um, and just start taking payments. Obviously, the person who's doing turnkeys as a rental, as an as a investment strategy, is making a nice profit. They're buying junk and cleaning it up and then reselling it to dummies like me for higher, higher prices. So these are kind of your different exit strategies on non-performing. Really, there's, you know, even lieu and foreclosure. And then if you can get the asset to modify, then you've got all your same performing exit strategies. All right, let me see what, what else. What markets, um, sorry, what, what markets or institutions are you using to find opportunities and then actually purchase? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I've kind of dodged that one so far today. Uh, I haven't talked about how to buy, actually buy a note. Um, I do want to talk about that. Let me do a couple more foils and then ask your question in a couple of foils. When we get, we're going to get to Q and A, I think in just a couple of foils. I want to wrap up the what is a note kind of conversation and then we'll get to how to buy. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, um, how to manage a note. So I talked about the fact that there's a loan servicer and they, they're supposed to do the work, right? We are guiding them on what we want them to go do, but they are the ones that do the actual work or the hire the work out. They collect the payments, they take care of escrow taxes and insurance, um, they're licensed and compliant, because I don't know about you, but I don't wanna stay at the Gray Bar Hotel. Uh, it's not an attractive option, so you need to make sure that you are using a servicer so you're licensed and compliant, and they manage the borrower workout. They still have to come to you to get approval to do the to make the deal and get your signature, um, but they do all the work related to that. They will also, I don't have it on there, but if you get into the non-performing or rehab space, almost all the servicers have uh, contractors around the country that will go out and do the contracting for you on rehab and all that. Um, there's there's a lot of details in that that I'm not going to get into today. Um, but the bottom line is the borrower sends the payments to the servicer and then the servicer sends us the payments like we talked about earlier. It's an outsourced and pretty passive business unless you choose to get into the non-performing side of the business where it can become a day job. I, I When I had my 34 assets, 18 of those were non-performing and it got kind of stressful doing my uh, my day job and also trying to keep those non-performing loans afloat. The nice thing about non-performing is the profits can be much higher. The downside is, of course, there's more work involved. I think that's um, that's really the last foil I had. So let's circle back. I want to touch on the how to buy a note. So um, there are uh, so. 
notes are sold by banks, right? So we all, we heard talked earlier about the fact that banks resell their notes to somebody else. The transactions that we see, the, us in the Pacific Coast and in nice homes, the transactions we see are going from one bank to another. Occasionally, they go from one bank to a hedge fund. Uh, the majority of note sales in the country from banks are going to hedge funds, and these are hedge funds with uh, you know, $4 billion to invest on a given transaction, right? Big, big transactions. And if you go out and search Google for uh, note sales, uh, you'll find uh, bank note sales. You'll find uh, every couple of months, one of these big banks or Fannie Mae um, are selling off, you know, $8 billion in, tra in assets across, you know, 8,400 assets um, in three tranches of $2.5 billion a piece. Right. And so you and I, we're never going to participate in that 2.5 billion. I have processed through the paperwork for it and thought about applying for one, um, but I don't have access to two and a half billion dollars in this lifetime. Um, so I'm never going to participate at that really lucrative side. Obviously, if I could get those, there's real profit in there because those are bank loans like ours. Um, but you pay higher market markups for you pay higher percentage uh, of unpaid balance when you buy a really high quality note. From there, it filters down to the smaller hedge funds and the smaller hedge funds and the smaller hedge funds and eventually gets to a retail seller that will sell it on the retail market. And so there are, uh, I don't know, three or four or five today uh, retail places that you can go to buy notes. Um, now obviously, if you're going to buy retail, like just like the difference between buying retail um, you know, at grocery store Safeway instead of going to Costco, right? You pay a little more when you buy from Safeway or Raley's than you do from, from Costco or Sam's Club. Um, same thing's true in mortgage notes. Um, you can buy retail. Um, paper stack is one example. Uh, Colonial funding, I forget the name. No, uh, I'm going to forget the name of their, their spot. Um, there are three or four folks out there today that are selling more. They don't call it retail, but it's more or less retail sales and a very simple transaction. Um, there's pros and cons besides just the profits you can make there um, on those purchases. Um, you can also, once you get into the business a little bit, you start to build relationships um, depending on where you get your training. Um, I personally paid a lot of money for training uh, almost four years ago now. Um, that uh, uh, training, uh, that, that trainer uh, has a, um, a portal that they sell notes on to all their students and other people outside. And as a student, I got a discounted rate on their portal and got first access to their materials. That's how I started purchasing my notes. Um, other trainers have similar setup. Um, and then you have a class of folks that are out there that are, um, uh, I've got several friends that are like me, that they're, they're doing a day job or not, but they've got, they want to make money in the note business. And one way to make money in the note business is to broker notes. So I can buy a note for 69,000, resell it for 73,000 to somebody who's, um, you know, I buy it with a, a a uh, 14% discount. I sell it with an 11% discount and I pocket the 3% right or I pocket a fee up front and then I, re I resell it. That's called brokering. Um, there's several people that I could hook you up with that do broker notes and they'd be happy to have you guys as customers. Um, uh, there are um, individuals selling notes um, on trade platforms like eBay, right? And the eBay doesn't do it, but I don't think, I, don't, I hope not. Um, but there are uh, portals like eBay that sell mortgage notes. And so individuals, I have sold many notes that way. I go out and I get top dollar by reselling my note on, uh, on a platform like eBay. And I get a bunch of bids. I pick the top bid and then I work the transaction with them offline. Um, and that works as well. So, uh, and then finally, knowing somebody who's got a note and is willing to sell it to you. Um, I don't currently have any notes for sale. I'm not coming here to sell you guys anything. A couple of years ago, I was really interested in, in getting to know Intel investors and working with you guys to put your money together and, um, and do a fund. And uh, I probably would still consider doing something like that. Um, but it's more of a day job. Uh, honestly, if you're thinking you're going to use other people's money to get into note investing, um, just be aware that there is work involved in managing other people's money. And um, uh, the profits are kind of low until you can get... I, I was managing, like I said, it was south of $2 million in, 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 in other, other people's money, mine included. 
Um, and I was making very little money yearly. It wasn't worth my time, honestly. I would make great money working. We all make great money working at Intel. The money we make here is ridiculously high. And you know, the money you're going to make managing somebody else's assets until you can get 10 or $20 million, until you can get to that range, you charge them 10%, what are you going to make? 100 grand? I mean, if you have to work 40 hours a week managing to make 100 grand, why not work at Intel and make more than that, right? So, um, you guys didn't ask about would I would I manage your money? And I, I my general answer is no. I'm happy to help you guys figure out if you're interested in note investing. I do think it's an interesting business model. I think there are lots of ways to make money, and I didn't cover half of them in in this space. Just buying and selling the assets is one way, but there's lots of other ways like brokering and uh, training, and there's all these other scenarios where you can make really good money. The the biggest school that I the school that I went to charges forty thousand dollars. Uh, for a, uh, a um, uh, access to a, a massive program full of education and mentors and deal review and uh, on and on and on. Um, they also have a port, a platform for selling assets. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a you pay a lot up front, a uh, lot relatively up front, but you get a lot of training wheels to put on the side of your cart while you're learning and keeps you out of trouble. I didn't want to lose my money, so I decided to pay extra for training. Um, but that's just my experience. Some of you might be thinking you're going to go to bigger pockets and you're going to read about how to invest with notes and then you're just going to do it. And um, I would say that's a very high risk scenario in any asset class, including rentals and everything else. There's lots of ways to lose money out there. I hope I've been clear. I, any investment outside of Intel just coming to day job and, and putting your money in the savings account. Any investment is high risk. So uh, notes are high risk also. Richard, um, do you, um, you know, in thinking about you, you, you started this whole thing with the idea of, of thinking about retirement income streams and yeah. so forth, right? Yeah. Um, do you, uh, as part of either your training or what you've learned over time now, it, you know, if you instantly stopped from Intel now and switched to this as your as your retirement income methodology, um, cash flows and so forth, would you change anything from what you have already kind of shared with us, the basic structure? Um, so, you know, I uh, if you're asking if I would change the assets that I, I don't think you're asking the assets that I invested in. Restate your question so that I answer it in the direction you want to go. Um, I'm I'm thinking. Uh, so uh, a lot of us are on this call looking for wealth building, right? Yep. And yep. you're you've talked about wealth building. You talk about tax avoidance and how to shelter and all that kind of stuff. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of us that are on here that are thinking uh, uh, close to where you are in time frame. Uh, I'm near where mm -hmm. you are in age, and I'm thinking about what a cash flow looks like when I don't have my W two anymore from from yeah. Mother Intel and all of her you know, wonderfulness. Yeah, so. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm trying to think through structuring. Uh, is there something that you see fundamentally different in the way that you would be focusing on the types, not specifically these assets, but the types of deals that you would steer towards, knowing that you're you're thinking more about cash generation at that point? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So um, uh, there's a couple of different strategies in in investing, right? Are you investing for the short term cash flow, or are you investing for wealth, right? Um, if you take a hundred thousand dollars and you put it in an 11% return, you're going to get, you know, whatever that is, a thousand dollars a month, um, a little bit less than that, 700 bucks a month. Um, so great. You got a half a million dollars. You can get 3,500 bucks in month, a month in, in investment, whether it's off of rentals or off of notes, you can get a decent number. And, you know, if you've got a half a million dollars, you can turn a, a three or four grand a month in payments and everything's happy. Um, you give up your access to your cash, but then you get this payment stream. Um, that's uh, that's one way to convert your current Intel generated for your, your generated 401k into payments. You can also put it into annuities and other things like that. Um, another thing to focus on and what I've done a little bit of, like I talked about with the partials, is long term wealth. Right. So um, can you take a certain amount of your money and divert it into things like partials where you don't get payments for now, right? The partial that I sold, I sold five years ago, something like that. It's due to pay off in the next year, year and a half, depending on how that borrower pays out. And I will be getting a payment stream of, I think it's $545 for the next 25 years. Um, that took a bunch of work and things didn't go that smoothly. And I don't know if he's on the call, but 
but um, <laughs> he might be. And um, he's not particularly happy, the guy that bought that that partial from me, because the borrower didn't hasn't paid perfectly. Um, that investor is still getting an 8% return. So I think from that perspective, they're happy, but um, it's been bumpy and they don't get payments every month. But on my side, right, uh, I'm still making sure that borrower, so that, that investor is whole and he's getting paid. So I'm not too uncomfortable with where he is. And when he's finally done and he's gotten his final return, I will have a nice 20 plus year income stream of 500 bucks. So how many of those do you need, right? For me, I spend a certain amount of money every month in today's dollars and I would you know, if you've played the cash flow game, right? If I can get that amount of money coming in from passive investments, then I can quit my day job, right? Um, and then I have my 401k that I never have to touch. That's my goal is to replace my day job income with passive investments. Passive is important, right? Because I don't want to have a day job when I leave my day job. I want to replace my day job income with passive investments so I don't have to touch my 401k until much, much later. Right. So when the market crashes, um, then I don't have to go and pull money out of the 401k at that down at that downturn time. Now, I don't really need the full amount of money, my full income. I could take a half or even a third and retire today. And so I'm actually I've been doing this now for a little over three years. I'm actually in a spot where if my boss pisses me off, I don't think I would really be unhappy. I don't think he's on the call. I don't, wouldn't be particularly unhappy. I could walk and I couldn't get, I don't have my current income coming in, in, in passive income, but I've got enough of it to where I could draw off of that plus a little bit of my 401k and it won't get burnt down even in a really bad downturn on the 401k. So I'm more comfortable than I was four years ago. And uh, I'm pretty happy with where I am. My my risk right now for all of you, if you're just getting started, is the market's really high and it's high in real estate. It's high in the stock market. And, you know, my daughter came to me a couple of weeks ago and told me she wants to buy a house. And I've been telling her for a couple of years, don't do it. Meanwhile, the price values keep going up. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. Right. It's each of us to figure out what our risk tolerance is. My answer is attend these meetings and find an asset class that interests you and then go ed get, invest in education and a mentor. And dip, dip, your, dip your toe in. If $20,000 is a number that's comfortable for you, put 20 grand in with a mentor or with a fellow investor who knows how to do it and see. give Daniel, give Daniel 20 grand to go put into his apartment complex or find one of my guys and put 20 grand into a note or you know, go do a rental with the guy that spoke up earlier on rentals and give him 20 grand and put that in there. Find somebody that knows how to do it that you can partner with to try it out and see if you like the asset class. I'm gonna say one more thing. Um, a couple of years ago, I was on a, I was in Cabo with uh, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, with a group of note investors, and uh, we spent a week down there. And I'm on a boat, this beautiful yacht, and it's all cool and everything. I'm not paying for it, and some big wealthy dude that owned the that that ran the note club uh, was paying for the boat and everything. And I'm talking to this guy, and I realized that this guy is a complete shark, right? I am a guppy, and he's a shark. And he is going to swallow me whole if I give him the chance. So don't give him my account numbers. Don't give him anything he can do to hurt me and just try to learn what he's good at. And I thought, is that the kind of person I want to do life with? So one of the risks that we play as Intel and to Intel employees, right? And just professionals, we get used to everybody around us being honest. And we're, there's still some grumpy people and there's politics in the work, workplace, but everybody's pretty darn honest. They, they're they here for the long haul um, in real estate, whether it's rentals or fix and flip or real estate or, rent or apartments or notes or anything else. There's a lot of crooks out there. Just think about real estate as uh, used car sales, right? Would you go to the local used car lot and trust the guy with your money? <laughs> no. You're going to pay an inspector. You're going to make sure you're doing the right thing. So find somebody in any real estate market that you trust. Uh, be careful who you invest with because there's a lot of crooks out there. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying there's crooks, so be careful. Hey, Richard, very well said. Um, thank you. Um, hey, a couple of questions. Did you look at other investments like you know, local real estate debt funds that provide 10%, pretty low risk, where you write them a check and then you do nothing. Yeah, so, so there's a bunch of REITs out there, right? Real estate investment trusts, right? Um, uh, they all tell you they're super low risk right up until they go out of business where the market turns down and they, they liquidate and you lose all your money. 
Um, yeah, they're, they all have risk. I don't care. I had a buddy. I don't, I don't know if Jesus is on the call. I had a buddy who invested in, uh, um, uh, a company that sold truck driving mortgages, uh, semi truck mortgages. And there was no risk because there's, I don't know, millions of trucks driving around the country and they all have mortgages on them. And this company buys and sells mortgages. Um, I think he put 50 grand into that, into that fund and lost all, almost all of it. Um, so yeah, and there's REITs, right. That, 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 you know, you can get on the stock market, but then you're just playing the stock market. So, um, all I would, all I'm saying is yes, I've looked at all that stuff and, um, uh, you know, there's a whole other asset class that I looked into, uh, alternative asset classes. You can pay folks to, uh, get involved with, um, everything from Bitcoin to ATM machines to uh, other types of uh, asset classes where there's really good money to be, to be made. Um, they all have their risk profiles. So find one you like and go get educated on it. Don't find one you don't like. Don't, don't educate yourself on one you don't like. Find one you like and spend your time learning about that and figure out, find a mentor because there's lots of asset classes out there. Hey, Richard. Um just because you are like wonderful. I mean, this is the best presentation that I have, you know, so much interactions. Um, uh, I mean, you know, we have every every week, right? So I, I really appreciate you, you know, telling a lot. Um, it, it just, uh, you know, because of your experience as an advice kind of question, if I am good at what I'm doing, should I still diversify? You mean, are you the guy with the rentals? Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, I we we need to talk offline to figure out what your what your what your what your goals are and um uh what you think sure. your risk what you think what your risk tolerance is and whether whether um and we can do it right here if you want um today or some other time but uh, everybody could listen in on how we have that conversation uh, at the end of the day um uh. Uh, you have a day job, right? So yeah, you're employed job, right. by you're employed by a company that expects you to show up 50 hours a week plus, right? And be available during COVID, be available 24, right? And uh, do you have time to go learn a whole new asset class? And I, and let me just ask a question. You can choose not to answer it, but how much money have you lost on any given transaction in rentals? Um, so far, my rental, I have not lost. Um, oh, good. I mean, my loss is very minimal to the gain that I have. Um, and I actually invest in, in West Coast. Uh, it's not like California, Oregon. Most of my investment in the West Coast because I can, I can afford there. I mean, that's the same way that you, you say, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I have... On a single transaction, you've never lost money? No, I only huh? lost, um, I only lost a, you know, a legal battle. That is the only okay. loss that I had. But other than okay. that, even during the COVID, I mean, you know, I got paid. Good, good. Yeah. So most investors that are are have any experience will tell, be able to tell you about losses they've had, and the difficulty that that what 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 happens is you you gain experience by making mistakes, right? If deals all go well, then you're not gaining much experience because you're just getting checks and everything's happy. Um, that one loss that you lost taught you a bunch and you probably would do that transaction differently on the second second pass if you could do it over again. Um, the difficulty getting into notes, you know, I lost money on a few different transactions and I've made a lot of money on other transactions. So net net I'm up, but um, I'd be up a lot more if I had, didn't have to pay for all that quote unquote education. Can and I paid for that education a little bit more. Can you talk about that education a little bit more? Because you also say that you invested in mentoring and training yeah. in 40k yeah. up front and yet you still talk about the yeah. the the failures and the learnings that you got there and stuff right, and, right. And, okay so i'll go a little bit deeper into my story um and uh we still got a few people on the call um but uh yeah so i paid 40 grand up front for training from a well-known note school and um uh they mentored me and gave me gave me everything I needed in order to be successful. They sold me notes. They um, uh, pointed out the places that I could lose money. They walked me through all of that. And at some point, um, uh, I started, figure, started trying to ask, you know, how can I move up 
the the value chain? How can I um, make make a better purchase, get a better purchase price, right? Because we all know you make money in real estate on the purchase, right? So I thought, okay, well, these guys are offering me pretty high dollar. It's pretty much retail uh, prices for notes. I'm getting a discount versus their actual retail site, but it's pretty high. Um, these folks over here and these folks over there, they're offering notes much cheaper. Maybe I should buy one from them. And so I didn't ask my mentor. I didn't bring that, say, that first transaction to the, the, actually, I did first few transactions I did bring into the mentoring and I got advice and didn't buy some and did buy a couple others. But on one of them, I didn't bring in. And that particular note seller is a crook. Um, if I had gone to my mentor with that note seller's name, he would have told me to never talk to her again. Um, if you ask me offline, not on recording, I'll tell you what that person's name was. Um, but um, I bought that note for $11,500 and it was in Inkster, Indiana. I paid $11,500 with somebody else's money, one of my investors' money. Um, and uh, uh, I missed something in the due diligence that uh, today jumps out at me like, you know, blinking red letters, but didn't at the time. And um, basically that asset was worth zero. Maybe it's worth a few hundred bucks, but it wasn't worth eleven thousand five hundred. Um, I gave eleven thousand five hundred dollars to my investor that that I had invested his money for, and I took personally took the loss of eleven thousand five hundred. That's not in my contract. I don't owe that to anybody. Uh, when they invest in me, with me, they choose to put their money at risk. But I know I lose investors if I ever lose them money. And so, if you guys invest with anybody else, make sure that they have a reputation for giving people, giving their investors money back when the loss has happened, even though legally the contract won't say they will do it, make sure they've got a reputation for doing that because it's super important. Anyway, I lost 11,500 on that transaction. Legally, I could have filed a lawsuit against her and I could have chased her down and on and on and on. I could have gotten money back, but it would have been a huge pain in the butt. And I'm just generally not a litigate, uh, a guy that likes to go in after law lawsuits and such. So um, I didn't choose to go do that. Um, I have other assets. Um, I bought a, what, what, what my mentor called a grab bag. Um, it was eight assets, uh, non-performing across the Midwest. I paid 50,000, 45,000, something like that for the grab bag. Um, there was about $400,000 in unpaid balance on this asset clap pool that I bought for, for 50 grand. Um, uh, my mentor told me not to buy it, told me to run the other way, said the seller was no good, said that the assets were really damaged and that I'd have to work very hard to get any profit out of the deal. I thought he was just being um, conservative and I chose to buy them anyway. This was two years ago in February. And it took me a year and a half to get back to break even on those assets. I think I'm up like $8,000 on a $50,000 investment over two years with a lot of a lot of education. Um, so I did not listen to my mentors. Right? In both of those scenarios, and I've got others, um, I did not listen to my mentors or didn't even ask my mentors because I thought I was smart enough by that point to make a better decision or I thought they were maybe not having my best interest in heart because they want to sell their assets and not have me buy somebody else's or, you know, a lot of reasons why we choose not to listen to people around us. Um, so I paid for mistakes with money. Um, I, so that's far, a, knock on wood, I haven't lost. Itself, huh? <laughs> Sorry? I said, that's the lesson in itself, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Now, you know, on that asset that I bought in Inkster, Indiana, uh, I learned two really good lessons. Number one, don't buy from an unknown seller, right? So um, there's these sites I told you guys about, like eBay, that that do retail sales. The problem with those sites, just like on eBay, uh, unless they have thousands of reviews, you don't know who you're buying from. And so if you if you were to go to eBay and buy a um, I don't know, a dishwasher, and the person had never sold anything on eBay, you'd be pretty dumb to make that purchase, right? But if you bought it from a seller who had 400,000 transactions, all five star, you feel pretty safe. And so um, that rating system doesn't exist in the note marketplace. And so buying retail notes is kind of a high risk scenario, because if you happen to buy from this one, but if that seller that I told you about earlier, I didn't give you her name, but if she was selling on, on these retail platforms, you wouldn't know it was her and uh you'd be buying junk so um yeah 
you just got to be careful. So what I do to, to I, two, I learned two things out of that transaction. One is vet the seller, make sure you know the seller and that they've got a reputation. And number two, uh, have somebody else review the due diligence. Once you've done everything you can possibly do to make sure you want to make the purchase, pay somebody that's a professional in the space to review it, whether it be your mentor or it be somebody else, pay somebody a couple hundred bucks to go through it and say, yeah, you didn't miss anything. This looks as good as I, as far as I can tell, this looks good. If I had done either one of those steps, I wouldn't have lost the 11,500. So as true Intel retrospective, I did my retrospective on that transaction. And those are the two learnings that I took away on that one. So Richard, real quick, on this example where you said the lady was a crook, was she doing a partial sell nope. to you? No, nope. no, nope. she was selling uh, performing and non-performing notes on a tape. A tape is just a spreadsheet with a bunch of notes listed out on it with their their attributes that you care about. She was selling performing and non-performing notes and um, yeah, her contract in all caps on the back page said, um, you know, note is sold as is, there's no guarantee of any value, you know, blah, 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 blah. And most of the contracts say that. And so I ignored that. And the space in the in the title section, there was a comment that I didn't quite understand. I thought it I thought it was going to be OK if I had given that to a lawyer or given that to uh, you know, like I told you earlier, you can pay a lot or a little to different vendors to do things. If I had given it to the vendor I use now, he would have charged me 150 bucks and he would have said, run away. This is a bad note. And I wouldn't have made the purchase. It would have cost me 150 instead of 11,500. This is basically large scale and small scale, the same thing effectively with what, what MBS has taught the market in terms of quality of, of the, under, the underlying assets, no? What's an MBS? Um, like mortgage-backed securities, you know, bundled, uh, bundled notes, right? Mm, is it the same? Um, so, mm, yeah, sure. So a mortgage-backed security is a, a a group of notes that's being sold, like my little my little eight note pool that I bought for fifty grand. Exactly. Um, some, some were good, some were bad. Sure, Sim, very similar concept. The difference is they were sold as, you know, class A, you know, top rated, and and they were rated by third parties as super high quality. Right? They were being sold. It was basically just junk. They were being sold through, and everybody's making a profit until everything fell apart. So um, yes, it's the same thing. And yes, there are people that. You need to build relationships to and find good vendors so that they can go along with you. Anybody that invests in real estate will tell you that that they are not on their on their own. That they use they they have people that help them, whether it be lawyers or uh, contractors or uh, servicers or property managers or you know on and on and on. Right. But yeah, you're right. It's the same thing as the. My, my little tiny fifty thousand dollar pool was the same as those billion dollar pools that were being being sold. Cool movie too, by the way. <laughs> hey Richard, how do you find good mentors? Yeah, good question. Um, in the mortgage note space. Um, I've been doing it now for a few years. Um, I know who I trust and who I don't trust. I can tell when I go to the conferences. Um, there are, I don't know, three or four conferences a year uh, where where several hundred people show up, and they and COVID is a little bit different, but where several people, hundred people show up, and uh, your best value is not in the classes that are being taught, but outside the classes where you're walking around and you just bump into people. Those are the people that are actually ma making transactions. Most of the people attending the classes are just looky lose, um, uh, with a few exceptions, right? So, um, what I do uh, to find mentors is I talk to people and uh, coming to things like this and asking questions, listening to people talk, and figuring out if you trust the person that's talking to you. Um, and then, you know, at, when they when somebody tells you they're a fix and flipper or they've got rentals, ask them how many transactions they've done and how many losses they've had. If they've never done a transaction or if they've never had a loss, do you want them to be your mentor? I don't know, right? Um, not to offend the gentleman who was honest about his the fact that he hasn't lost. That's a great track record. I don't know too many successful no, uh, real estate investors that have not lost money. Um, it's part of the business. And so how do you find good mentors? Um, one way to do it is do what I did. You go to I went to a local RIA. Um, this school that I went to happened to show up and do a, 
a half hour presentation on node investing, not 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 very different from what I'm presenting here, right? Um, and they they charged me 98 bucks to come to a three day seminar. Or no, sorry, 98 bucks to come to a Saturday seminar. At the, at the Saturday seminar, they charged me $1,800 to go to a three day two to, to go to two three day seminars. Um, I went to those three day seminars and then I paid $40,000 for their school. And I trust that they are looking out for me because they want my $40,000 and they want a reputation for doing a good job. Um, if you go to Bigger Pockets, that's the other site that's actually a really, really good website, biggerpockets.com. The difficulty there is you don't know who's giving you advice. And mo like I said earlier, most real estate investors that I know aren't actually ever in doing any investment. All they're doing is talking and listening and thinking and, you know, postulating and they're stuck behind the data and the analysis paralysis and they never actually make a transaction. Uh, most people in this business are not doing anything. They're just talking about it. So find somebody who's actually got transactions and made losses and, you know, in the highs and the lows and then ask them if they'll let you go along with them on a transaction. Thank you. Hey, Rich, for somebody who's interested in uh, investment exposure in this segment, but not interested in doing the amount of leg work you have, uh, are there hedge funds or are there, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, there actually are. Um, um, if you want to send me a note, um, I'll hook you up with uh, one of the hedge funds that I use. Um, last time I talked to them, and it's been a year or more, they were offering 12% return um, again, assuming the market goes well, assuming that things go well, they were offering a 12% preferred return, um, which means they make nothing until you make 12%. And then beyond that, they take a, I think it's an 80-20 split of the remaining profit. Um, it was something like that. And I haven't talked to them, like I said, in about a year, but I'd be happy to hook you up offline. Okay. Um, they've got a large fund and there's a, several other funds like that out there that are, there's always people like I was a couple of years ago, trying to pull money together to uh, to create a fund to invest in any asset class. So Daniel's doing that with 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 uh, uh, apartments. Um, there's probably other people on this call right now that are doing that in other other spaces. Um, those are all interesting spaces. And if you've got a small amount of money you want to keep your toe in, I think it's a great great way to go and learn whether you would have done the transaction. Now, if you're doing something big like an apartment complex where it costs, you know, five million bucks for the pool, um, and you're only putting in twenty thousand, that that uh, investor is probably not going to give you much information. Um, but if you're putting up half the money on a transaction or more, um, that investor probably will walk you through what's going on and help you understand everything and teach you and train you. Sure, makes sense. Thank you. If anybody on the call wants me to give my personal opinion on a specific school or a specific investor, feel free to uh, send me their name and I'll give you my personal perspective. I probably won't put it in writing, um, but I know a lot of people in the note business and there's lots that I don't trust and there's quite a few that I do trust. And if you're looking to buy notes, I do have a couple of buddies that would flat out love to meet you. Um, um, so uh, be happy because that's how they make their money, right? They buy and then they resell at a little bit of a margin. They typically make a couple of grand on a $50,000 asset and move it on to the next person. So it's not a bad deal. Hey, Richard. Um, thank you very much for all the information you're sharing today. Um, I just wanted to actually ask, how do you just let bad deals go? Or like, I, I want to get to a level where I'm not so rigid on things like that and how do, how do you just overcome that or just be okay with that and just accept it and move on yeah um you probably heard the term sunk cost right um being at intel we we get trained that um the next roadmap decision doesn't necessarily depend on the prior sales or losses on a specific investment if we've put 150 engineers on a project and it's not going to finish out properly, we will cancel the project rather than just keep going because we funded it. You kind of have to adopt that same mentality with your investments. Um, uh, just because uh, um, just because you've put in 50 grand into an asset doesn't mean you should put another 50 grand in, right? So um, I have an asset that uh, uh, was in 
Indiana, I think. I was driving down the street. This was a couple of years ago in August. I was driving the neighborhood with a buddy at my one of my partners, and and um, going down. The, I've got this video running, my cell phone video running, and it's a really nice neighborhood near a college. I think Duke University. It's a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood. I'm going, man, this is awesome. Look at this neighborhood. I go, look at that piece of crap over there. Oh crap, that's my house. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, we got inside that house and everything about it was destroyed. And, um, we were, I think we were into the asset, something like 50 grand and, um, rehab was going to be 45, 50. We could have taken the house, torn it down and put in a pre-manufactured house for about 40. Um, we were kind of going to break even on the transaction. If we put another 40, 50 grand into the deal, we thought we could sell it for about 125. So it kind of, the neighborhood would have supported putting in 50 grand to try to get some profit out of it. Um, but then, um, we found out that the septic in that, in that County, you can't hook up to the public, uh, sewer and the septic was destroyed. The guy that owned the house owned a tire shop and he buried all the used tires in the lawn. Um, and when you put septic in the land, lot that the land has to be non-disturbed for the past 15 years. So you couldn't put septic in and you couldn't hook the septic up to the, the public system. So, um, that was going to be another, I don't know, 15, 20 grand. And I was like, wow, I'm in 50. I could put in 50 more and deal with this sewage problem, which might be another 20, 25. And maybe I could break even. I'm going to spend a year doing it or at least six months getting all this figured out. I got a day job. I got other investments other investors do i keep pushing more money in here or do i try to sell this at a loss and move on and so i wound up selling that property for i think it was like twenty two thousand dollars i contacted a bunch of local uh meetups and real, real estate associations in the neighborhood in the general area and i got one investor who gave me i think it was twenty two five for that property um he paid all closing costs he got the property for twenty two five and he probably did fine on it but because he knew all the contractors he knew all the laws in the area and I didn't have a team in the area, so I chose to walk. But I, so I walked away losing twenty five thousand, twenty three thousand, whatever the number was. Um, but I saved a lot of my own personal time, and and uh, I only got so many hours in this in this world left, and I chose not to fund them on that asset. Got it. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, Richard, before you take off, or can you provide contact information, please? Yeah, um, Thanks. yeah, so you guys can click on my name in Teams. Um, let me. Uh, oh, I was going to say, do you, do you run like outside external uh, contact info or do you do you want us to reach through uh, through Intel? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I don't have a problem with an email coming to my Intel email account. Um, from that point, I can just bounce you. We can bounce out to our personal email accounts. And I can. I guess it's not a bad idea. I can put my contact info up here. I just don't, I don't want to come across as trying to sell anything, guys. I, I'm really sensitive to, you know, do anything that becomes perceived as a shyster. So let's put my contact information here. about that prominentfunding.com yep that's me thanks much and great yep. topic thank you yeah you're welcome oh uh, we took the full two hours that daniel booked up front i don't know if he did that on purpose but we took the full two hours all right i'm going to go ahead and stop recording if there's any other questions you guys are welcome to uh